enjoying this series of the Night School of the Word. It's been a great privilege for me to have been able to study so many of these topics, to be able to go through them, and to be able to prepare them as well. And I really feel like they're going to be something that's quite foundational for each one of us who are here, and something that we'll look back to in years to come as being, we knew some of these things, but now we really know why we believe in them. And tonight we're going to tackle the subject of we believe in the church. Okay, now that's really good that you guys have all turned up tonight because you all belong to a church. And you're all part of the church, so you all understand church. So my job here is done, I can go home. (laughs) But it is really important, in today's world there are a lot of Christians that do not belong to a church. And their understanding of church is quite different than the historical understanding that we've had of church, which has been the assembly of people together or coming together week by week by week. And in some ways we've lost a whole bunch of understanding in our culture, and particularly the Christian culture, about the importance of church. So tonight I do want us to understand and leave here today saying, yes, that's why I believe in the church. That's why I believe the church is God's plan for me to get involved with and is God's plan for today. So you do have a lot of Christians who will dip in and out of churches, but still feel they're part of the church because they're a Christian, because they believe in Jesus Christ. And that's become something that's become very, very popular in today's Christian world. So I can be a Christian... (coughs) And I believe in Jesus Christ and I love Jesus, but I don't step in a church because they've hurt me, they've damaged me, they're hypocrites. Because, well, maybe even their pastor or their vicar wasn't really sure whether he believed in Jesus or not as well. You might laugh at that. Um, We know quite a few ministers around that have significant questions in their own faith. And then you feel like, well, there's no wonder some of their flock, some of the people that were under them, struggled with the whole concept of church. If the guys who are supposed to be leading them the things of God aren't really sure about it all as well. Then you've got this whole aspect of, do you know the devil doesn't want to have a strong church? So if you can do something that switches you off from church, that makes church awkward, that puts something in competition with church, that could be drinking coffee in your local garden centre. It could be going to Brid, the seaside, on a sunny Sunday morning. Do you know there's lots of things that will start to break you from going to church? That could be an awkward conversation. That could be anything. It could be that the pews aren't very comfortable. Do you know, it can take anything that can just make somebody feel slightly uncomfortable about wanting to attend together. And then it quickly stops people wanting to get engaged in church. So there are a lot of people out there that don't really believe in church and all that church um, wants it to be. (laughs) Good. So, um, what I want us to do tonight is have a look at a few of the things that are surrounding church and a part of church and even the attributes and the names and some of the things that the Bible has church described as. And I want us to have a look at them and I want us to understand what some of them are, to have a right proper understanding about church and all that God intended for church to be. So, I've got my pen and this is where you guys have to participate. You're all here so you all understand church. You've all been around in church for some period of time in your life so you have an understanding (coughs) of it. And of course you're all great (coughs) readers of your Bible so you'll recognise some of these phrases. So, what are some of the descriptive names that could be used for church. Happy. <laughs> Never mind charismatic or happy. Yes, they should be. Build it. What does the Bible use to describe church? So shall I give you an easy one? We are the body of Christ. Okay? So, body of Christ. Right. Yeah, so the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, 27... We are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. That's 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Um, 
I'm drawing her bride. I'm being the bride of Christ. So, bride is in Ephesians 5, verse 25. Um, there's the whole, whole symbolism there about the church being the bride of Christ. What else? Chosen people. There's lots about chosen, but particularly in Colossians 3, Colossians 3, verse 12. Therefore, as God's chosen people, we're holy and dearly loved. What else? Elect. We're going to put that in exactly the same as chosen. Specifically, plucked out, made to be. Does that pass, sir? That's fine. Good. <laughs> Loving. That be an attribute particularly of the church rather than the way that God described the church. So we'll come on to that one in a little bit of time. Royal priesthood. Royal priesthood. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to give the Bible verse to go with it? 1 Peter 2 verse 9. 1 Peter 2 verse 9. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. <coughs> I like that one. What do we have there? That was in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. Sons and daughters. Sons and daughters. So let's go for a family of God, just because that's what I chose to write down on here. Right. And it's less words for me to write. Um, so in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 18, 2 Corinthians 6, 18, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters, <coughs> says the Lord Almighty. That's a really good one. Sheep. Sheep, or the flock of God. <laughs> Um, so in 1 Peter 5 verse 2, be shepherds of God's flock. Uh, fellowship of believers. Fellowship of believers. That's a really good one. Can I go for people of God? <laughs> <laughs> fellowship. <laughs> okay, so... 1 Peter 2, verse 9 and 10, chosen people, royal priesthood. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. <coughs> so in 1 Peter 2, verse 10. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We're, we're a family, we're a fellowship, we're brought together as God's people. Thank you, Lord. We've got any more than anybody can think of? A great congregation? Great congregation, yeah. I haven't got a verse for it, it wasn't on the list. So yeah. 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 It's a good one. Psalm. Psalm 50. Let's go for that one, Psalm 50 something. <laughs> <laughs> but we are a congregation, we are a people together. So what about a household? So in Ephesians... 2 verse 19, we're no longer foreigners and aliens, but we're fellow citizens of God's oh, people and members of God's household. Oh, well. Yeah, we're members, same, same deal. What about, Saints. Yeah. We, we are, but the church often isn't described as a, that'd be a descriptor for you. So what about the vine and the branches? <laughs> So in John 15, I am the vine, you are the branches together as long as we remain in him. The redeemed of the Lord. <coughs> the redeemed of the Lord, yes you are. <laughs> um, what about just being a holy people? What did we have before? Holy nation. Um, so, in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and God's spirit lives in you? Congregation is in Psalms and in Acts. There's a congregation. Yeah, and that's us gathering 
together. Um, so what about a city on a hill? So in Matthew 5 verse 14, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it on a bowl instead. They put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. And of course, the input, there's, there's many more of these, but these are just some, some concepts that, after my research, I selected that I thought were particularly about the church. But one of the biggest things, really, is that across the top of all this, Christ is the head. And in Colossians 1.18, he is the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Christ is the head of all things. When you look at some of those things and some of the other things we, we've looked at, you get a concept that the church and all of those different names relate to something that is part of the church. We are called to be the body of Christ. His bride, we're chosen, we're royal. We're part of a family, we're a flock, we're a fellowship. We're a household together, we're the vine, we're... <coughs> Holy, and we're a city on a hill. We're all of those things. That is what the church is intended to be. So often we just think about the church and we think about, oh, I don't know, all sorts of things. We, we think about maybe a, a stuffy, derelict, old building. And that is so different than what the church really means. So the original um, Greek word that's used uh, for the word church is, does anybody know this for bonus points for their team? Ecclesia. Ecclesia. That was an easy one, wasn't it? You see, I'm not giving you really complex Greek tonight, giving you nice Ecclesia. And that literally means the congregation was first used for the children of Israel. And it got transferred to the Christian body um, as a representation. So it became the church, particularly the local people, the local church and it has a real concept and understanding of being a called out for a special purpose group of people and that i thought was really just like the children of israel were called out among all the nations to be a special chosen group of people ecclesia church has the same meaning it's a group of people who are called out chosen for a special purpose so that is really what the church means and there's a famous um, verse from Matthew 16, verse 18. It's, Jesus says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not <coughs> overcome it. On Peter, on the rock, Jesus is going to build his church. And there's no wonder that Peter was then one of those instrumental people to actually build what we know as the body, the, the church, the chosen people, and he was instrumental in making all of those early church decisions and making it happen. Because Jesus gave him a very specific purpose to build his church. And this is one of those really powerful verses that we could spend forever, well not forever, but a very long time analysing. Because the gates of Hades will not, not overcome it. That doesn't mean we're not going to face persecution. And it doesn't mean that Hades is not going to, the devil, the evil one, hell, is not going to rise up against the church in a vast way, with big attacks. But they will not overcome the church. They might damage the church, they might cause great distress in the church, but never overcome it. And that's the really important thing. And this is, if you like, one of those concepts that the church is vitally important with. If you are outside of the church, it's as though you're outside of the castle. You're outside of the walls of protection that God has planned to be built, to be foundation. So that when a wave comes, when the enemy comes, if you're outside of the church, you could be overcome. But when you're inside the ecclesia and the church and and the function that God has enabled that to be, 
then the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Then nothing that's come from the evil one can, can overcome it. And that is the real important part about church. There is something of great, great strength that God intends for church to be. And that's something that Christians outside of church don't necessarily have. But when they become part and grafted into the vine, into the body of church, they help strengthen that church. And the church then becomes something that nothing can overcome. Let's not forget in the middle of all this, that verse from Colossians 1.18. He is the head of the body, the church. He's also the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. He's the head of everything. But when it comes to the church, it's his design, his headship, his supremacy, and nothing happens as part of church or surrounding church that wasn't Jesus' unique design and purpose and creation for it, unless we choose to step out of it. But he's got a plan and a purpose for church. He ordained it, he called it to be, he set it in motion and he's been enabling it ever since. Because that's what God does. So there's two parts to church, really. We talked originally about how there are believers. There are believers. In 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, we were all baptised, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, we were all baptised by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. In 1 Corinthians 3, 16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple? And that God's spirit lives in you. This is the great, royal, universal church. You're part of it if you're a believer. Whether you're an attender or not, you're part of the universal church. If you like the Catholic, small c, church, you're part of it because you're a believer. You're in the body. But actually, that doesn't mean you're part of God's common purpose, which is the local <coughs> church. And there's been a lot of confusion because, oh, there's just been a lot of confusion. Okay, it's a bit awkward to explain every single thing that's gone on before, but there's a lot of confusion because there's a lot of damage. And because if somebody could weaken the church, they can weaken what God's plan and purposes are. But they're never going to win because the final deal is already sealed. Because Jesus Christ has won the final victory and will forever. And his word says the gates of hell is never going to overcome the church. So it doesn't matter what they do, it's still not going to overcome it. But the strength comes from within the local church. The local church are out of the 114 references of church in the Bible, 96 out of the 114 relate to the local church. Okay, so anybody who tries to tell you that the local church isn't important in the New Testament really has missed the concept altogether that most of the references, 90% of the references in the New Testament relate to the local church. Not that big universal church where, well, I'm a believer, so I'm part of the universal church. Yes, you are, but actually, a whole raft of the Bible, most of the New Testament that relates to church, relates to your local fellowship, if you like. Your local body, your local church. And it's local because you belong to it. And you're part of it. And it's part of what God's plan was for your church. So... I hope you can really come up with these nice answers that I've got written down and prepared on my sheet again. And you're all going to forgive me if we're on totally different tracks here. Okay? What should a local church be like? And I don't mean that atypical, dilapidated old building, maybe with a bell on the top and some gravestones outside and six old ladies that everybody else regards as needing a spiritual crutch, which is why they go to church and they've done it for the last 80 years of their life and they can't do it now. I'm talking about, because the church isn't the building, is it? The church is the congregation of people together that make the local church. We used to have a church before we ever moved into this venue. Some of you were there. It was Destiny Church. Even before we moved 
and became part of Destiny Church. We had a different name. We were still the church. You ran <laughs> to a different church in a different location before you became part of Destiny Church, but you're still the church. The name, not really important. It is, it helps give us identity. The building, not really important. It's useful, it's an amenity, it's a way for us to be able to meet together and communicate together. But we would still exist as a church without, if the name changed or the venue changed, so what? The local fellowship, the local church still happens. So what should a local church be like? And I'm going to give you the very first one to set you on track, okay? To try and give you a train of thought. So we, we described this at the beginning. So Jesus at the head. So in Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23, it says, And God placed all things under his feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way. That's Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. And Colossians 1, 18, we have, have that already, that he is the head of the body, the church. So what else? I'll take that one off my list and we'll see if we can come up with any more of these. So what should a local church be like? What are some of the fundamental things? Welcoming. But you're going to want to be welcoming because we love people. And we're called to love people. So we had one here that was anointed. So Jesus was anointed for a purpose. In Luke 4, verse 18 and 19, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Every church needs to be anointed to do its work. But it won't necessarily have the same anointing that Jesus had. Because God is a unique God. Each church will have its own unique anointing, its own special DNA, its own <coughs> special purposes, its own speciality, if you like, about what it is called to do, that will be in line with its vision. In Acts 10 verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. And that is what anointing does. It's wherever the message is preached, wherever the local church happens, the Holy Spirit comes and enables the message to get communicated to all of the people who are there. Okay, we're going to Safety. Yep. Yeah, a church should be safe. A church should be... Um, Nick from something further on. We're going to come back to that one because I've got it written down. We'll come later on if we get there. So, I oh know I've got it here. A safe family. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 40, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Because it shouldn't just be safe physically, it should be safe emotionally, spiritually, psychologically. It should be safe in everything that you're done with safety and proper common sense in a fitting and orderly way. In Ephesians 5 verse 15, be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but wise. So a local church should never tell you like some of these cults have that we all need to go to a barn somewhere in the funny country and wait for a meteor to come past. <laughs> That's the truth. That's what a safe family does. It shouldn't lead you into crazy situations. Now that's a very extreme example. But there have been other things that have been just on the edge of being, hang on a minute, what in the world is going on there? But because your family says that it's from a position of safety, you end up believing some of the truth in that. Do you know there is some screwed up theology going around in Christian, contemporary Christian circles at the moment? There is controversy that is trying to change bits of the Bible. At the moment, both in our legal system but around churches, in our country all the time. The principles that we held dear as being Christian principles have been eroded in our country. And very easily those things creep and happen and happen and happen. And you know, most of those things happen because Christian leaders, people like me, 
stands from a pulpit like this, and we will tell you something that we now believe is the truth that is different than it was before. Yeah. Worry about those things, because the church should be safe. Yeah. It doesn't mean we're going to get everything right all the time, but the church should be safe. Yeah. It should be stable, because the Bible, it ain't changed in a couple of thousand years. Yeah. Yeah. If God was going to change it, he could have. He can, but he promised he won't, because it's the truth. So when he comes back again, he's going to change it, and it's all going to make sense. <laughs> but meanwhile, I'm not going to start ripping things out, crossing things out, changing things. I'm just going to hold true to what the Word of God says. Yes. And as long as we can try and be safe, we can produce a safe family that's credible, that's safe, that keeps us in a doing what God wants us to do in a real safe way. So church should be a safe family. <laughs> Loving. A church should be loving. We're going to come back to that one because we should all be loving to one another. It's quite simple. Love one another. Why? He loved us. And if I can't love my brother, well, I'm in trouble big style, aren't I? Because I'm actually called to love everybody. So it's easy to love us. Supporting and caring. Those are some of the things that the church really brings to you. As well. I um, bought this. Let's, let's go for that one. We'll go for. How about? Well, I just put that one into the category of encouraging. Okay. Because I thought it was a bit broader. So in Hebrews 10, verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. I couldn't do a Bible study on the church without including, oh, you've got to come to church because thou shalt not forsake the assembling together. Or whatever the King, is that right in the King James Version? It's something like that, isn't it? But we've got to keep meeting together for the purpose of how we can spur one another on. And we're spurring one another on towards love, towards good deeds, which is actually showing love to other people. And they even acknowledged back then that some are in the habit of not meeting together, not coming together to encourage one another. They were not attending together. And actually, they were being quite selfish because they weren't encouraging each other. And that's so often how it goes. And even more so as we see the days approaching. Well, do you know what? We're closer now yes, we are. than we were yesterday. Yeah. I've yeah. still got too much to do for it to be tomorrow. But we're closer now than we were yesterday. If he comes tomorrow, that's fine. God, you're more than welcome to. Steve, you won't have to edit the broadcast tomorrow. Um, but we need to encourage one another. We need to be part of that loving family. Do we have any more? To be salt and light to the world. Salt and light, share the gospel. Um, which one should we go for on that? Should we go for fruitful? Just because I had it written down as fruitful in John 15, verse 2. What does Jesus do with every branch that isn't fruitful? Cuts it off. Throws it into the fire. He prunes it so that it will be even more fruitful. Because we are called to go into all the world, to make disciples. We're called to be fruitful people. We're called to be evangelistic. We're called to be people that go out there and make a difference. To be that salt and light. To be... We had it in the first section. The city on a hill. That verse goes on. What happens if salt loses its saltiness? It's worthless. Actually, we're called to make a difference. We're called to be uh, that thing. Let's go for another one that's sort of linked to that one. We're called to produce disciples. So in 2 Corinthians 3.18... It says that we're called to reflect the Lord's glory and be transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord. We're called to be ever-increasing, growing together. <coughs> and the church should grow. The church should ever-increasingly reflect more and more and more of God. Just like our life should. So should the church. It should grow. Um, can I give you some more that I had? We need to proclaim Jesus in Acts 
Acts 28 verse 31. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ. Without hindrance, churches should go out and preach the kingdom of God and teach about the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, what about this verse from the Psalms? Then we had this earlier, well, one similar earlier, from Psalm 127 verse 1. Unless the Lord builds the house, yeah. it's builders labour in vain. So actually it's got to be part of God's purpose. A local church should do what God wants it to be. And what about, and these two are linked together already, but a church, local church should have God-ordained leadership. Good squiggle. Anybody can read it. So it should have good leadership. In Acts 20, verse 8, keep watch over yourselves and the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be sure to the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. And it's the Holy Spirit that really anoints people and ordains people for those leadership overseeing roles. We're going to have a look in one of the next um, nights call of the words about calling for ministry and about all those different bits and pieces. So we won't go into some of that now. But the other thing is that God gives us a clear vision. Because a local church should have a clear vision of its individual purpose. Not that the wider church has a vision to proclaim the kingdom of God and to be all that God has asked it to be. Churches together have that same vision. But a local church also has its own individual purpose. And God usually gives that to the lead pastor. And it would be a unique calling just for that church. And do you know God, through the whole of the Bible, always uses individuals to communicate his plans and his purpose for something to do. So he calls somebody out, he plucks them out of obscurity, he gives them what he wants them to do. Moses up a mountain, Joshua. The Bible's filled with those people that God calls out and enables to go and be that man, that woman, that purpose for his will to be done. And do you know the vision of one church is going to be quite different than the vision of another church because they're not called to fulfill their, each other's purpose. They've got their own purpose to fulfill. Together they'll all be part of God's big master plan. And when each church, when each, if you like the body ministry, when each person in the body functions, it's a great body that all functions. Well, when each church functions the way it's supposed to, wow, it's going to be an amazing something to watch the body of churches function the way that God intended them to function. And um, what about this one then? Churches, and, and this is something that's become very modern, we've been shoved in a box that says we need to feed the poor, the needy, and the orphans. And actually, cultural society would have church as that being probably its only purpose and function. Because that's all they really want us to do. Do you know there's not an awful lot of that in the Bible? I don't mean to be really controversial there. But we're loving people, so we love people. So we help them. We care for them. In Acts 22, in, in Acts 2 verse 42, all the believers were together and had everything in common. They had great koinonia within the believers. That's what the Bible says. So they sold their possession and helped those believers that were in need together. Actually, it was quite selfish. Love meant that they went and reached people, that they went and gave a cup of water read the verse in Romans 12 verse 13 that said share with God's people who are in need practice hospitality with God's people who are in need it doesn't say with everybody but we should from an aspect of love as well go and provide a cup of water go and do those things but we're also called to in 1 Timothy 5 there's a great passage there that really sums this up and if you want to have a, a good read of something go and read 1 Timothy 5 um, because it gives a clear list that says yes we should protect the widows 
but dum -da -dum -da -dum -da -dum -da -dum -da -dum -da dum of a list of how to be sensible in doing it. So in 1 Timothy 5 verse 3, it says, we need to give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. We should be a loving, caring people. Hear me right on this. We love people. We do. We're going to keep providing for people. But the Bible and the New Testament is very, very clear how we do this. And it's got a whole bunch of wisdom in how we need to do it. So we need to protect the widows, the orphans, the poor. But we need to do it in a proper way that brings long-term stability, long-term change in people's lives. We should show compassion. And the Bible goes as far as saying we should. And provide them with a cup of water. I'm not making that up, am I? Okay, I'm just being real here. I didn't like some of this when I read it, and it doesn't mean we're not going to still keep providing for people all over the place because we love them. <laughs> because we want to show them Jesus. But don't let culture and the expectation of what culture has bullied church into being as being a soup kitchen and being a food bank and being everybody's salvation army provision for them that is not everything that the Bible has for us to do. The Bible says that we need to do it in a really wise, really ordered, really patterned way. We do that, those selfless things within the fellowship of believers, within koinonia, within the fellowship, within the church, because that's what brings stability. That's what brings everything that God has intended for us to be. We need to share, Romans 12, share with God's people who are in need. God's people. That is everybody as well. But firstly, it comes that we do it from within where we're at. I know that might be a little bit of a controversial one, but a local church will protect those people who are part of the flock. What does a pastor do? Takes his sheep to green pastures. His sheep. Takes his sheep to safe places. His sheep. Protects who from the wolves? His sheep. That's what a pastor does. That's what a local church does. That is the function of a church. And society has bullied us, I believe, into something that often stretches the resources of a church beyond where it should be. Now we should, from our heart of compassion, from our love for people, be reaching out every single way that we can to connect with people, to bring them in to bring them in and that I think is the real safe aspect of this it's not that we just throw stuff over the wall but we bring people in and we bring people in and we bring people in and from within that's where we can then really help people and change their lives forever because the best thing we could ever give somebody is not just the full stomach but it's Jesus sometimes we might need to feed their stomach so they'll listen to us about Jesus Sometimes we might need to feed their stomach so they stay with us for long enough to eat the food and it gives us a great opportunity to preach with them about Jesus. It's how we evangelize the people as well. We've got to do both halves. But we've got to do it in a real sensible, long-term way. And the Bible is, it's filled with both generosity and it's filled with that great sense of, of having a, a real plan for how we're going to win people for Jesus. So a church also brings you a great raft of things. So a church brings you personal growth. Because a church is where you're supposed to grow. A church brings you protection. A church brings you shepherding. A church brings you counsel. A church brings you provision. A church brings you a great sense of belonging. A church brings you family. It brings you encouragement. It brings you opportunities. And church really has the best concept of synergy that could ever exist. Because what I can do on my own is one. What I can do with somebody else becomes more than the sum of those two. That's what synergy means. So one plus one equals more than two. And church, when we all come together as part of the church it enables us to do something that singularly none of us could do combined even none of us could do but combined with God something dramatic changes and church becomes a massive force that is to be totally and utterly 
reckoned with. In 1 Peter 5, there's a great passage there that talks about how you're supposed to function within a church, how you're supposed to be part of the flock, how you're supposed to not be greedy for everything, but just eager to be one of those people that serves church, that enables people and uh, it even talks about young, we- young men being submitted to those who are older. And we've all got to clothe ourselves with humility. Because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So if you want something to read, his bedtime reading 1 Peter 5. And the biggest way that we can function in a church is to love one another. When there's problems, love. When there's something we don't like, love. When there's something that we maybe think we disagree with, Love first, then go and sort it out. No matter what happens within our local church, within our body, we should be loving people and loving each other first. Because if, how are we going to show the love of Jesus Christ if we can't love each other? There's great examples in the New Testament where the love that believers had for one another was one of the best evangelism things that ever happened in the New Testament. And in those places, they were known for loving each other. They'd only met each other for two weeks. They'd only been saved for for two weeks. But they already loved each other because of the faith that was in them, because of their heart's connection that happened. And that love overcame anything else that was going on. So the local church should have you in it, committed to it, willing to sacrifice for it, being selfless towards it as God's purpose for you because it is his vehicle for his will to be done. God's will on planet earth, the vehicle that God's will is going to happen in is the church. You're the mechanics that make it all work, but the vehicle together is the church and the local church. So your local church should have elders They oversee, they protect, they make sure everything's okay. It should have a set man, a vision holder, somebody that God has purposed there to say what its unique plans and purposes and where they should go and what it should be doing and how to do those things should be. It should have pastors, shepherds. Often it's the same person as as the lead pastor, but it can be a wider group of pastors. It can have other pastors, pastorally caring people. Often the elders do that. can have other disciples, ministers, people that are teachers, trainers. It can have supporters and faithful people in it, people who are learning, people who are growing, people who are on their way through. It should have access to all the Ephesians 4.11 ministries of, it was him who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Until... We all reach unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, blown here and there by every wind of teaching and the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Christ died for the church. In Ephesians 5 verse 25, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, the church. And this great verse from Isaiah 2, in the last days the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as chief among the mountains. It'll be raised above the hill and all nations will stream to it. Many people will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The local church is really important. It's our home and it's the vehicle that enables us to do more than we could ever singularly do because through the local church we reach people we help people from where they're at into a fantastic relationship with God we do that in a real sensible loving way 
that helps you grow into all that you can be and helps somebody that doesn't even know God realize their full potential in Jesus Christ. So we believe in the local church. We think it's vitally important. So do you. You're here. And the local church is something that we believe, well, Christ is coming back for his church. And we want to keep being his church. Because at the top of it all, Jesus Christ. Because it's his. He is the top of it all. Let's pray.